Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Let's try that again. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marco Davis, President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, CHCI, and welcome to the third installment of CHCI's virtual briefing series on COVID-19. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Today's session will focus on the pre-K-12 education uh, space and equity in a post-COVID-19 society. I'm pleased to share that Telemundo has joined us as a media partner once again, and they're streaming this session on their digital platform as well. And to that end, I have a brief message for the Telemundo audience. Buenas tardes a todos que nos ven a través de Telemundo. Espero que se encuentren bien en sus hogares. Gracias por su interés en nuestro programa de hoy. Les quiero informar que nuestra discusión será transmitida en inglés y pueden seguir sintonizando si gustan. Now, for those of you who are not bilingual, don't worry, I was just informing the Telemundo viewers that the program today will be conducted in English. So you're off the hook. <laughs> Before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that our nation is in many ways in the midst of two crises simultaneously. We continue to face the COVID-19 crisis, but also the legacy of systemic racism and its consequences that have been laid bare in the last few days, and people throughout the nation were expressing their solidarity with the black community, recognizing the pain felt in light of the killing of George Floyd, and tragically too many others to name, and raising their voices both online and in cities everywhere to seek racial and social justice in our society. At CHCI, we stand with the black community in this time, and we hope that together we can fight back against the injustices we see far too often and create a more fair and inclusive world. In fact, while there is so much work to be done, and indeed many people are raising their voices and taking action right now, among the many ways I think that we can and must work to advance as a nation is by empowering and equipping young people with a good and complete education so that as leaders, they can solve any problem and help us all move forward. But Sadly, as we know, that solid education is not automatic. And especially in the case of Latino and other communities, sometimes it is in fact elusive. And into this already challenging situation has come COVID-19, which brings us to our conversation today. Today, we're gonna to discuss education with a particular eye on schools and teachers in the pre-K through 12 space to understand where we are and what can be done in both policy and practice to strengthen education while forging a way forward for Latinos, and by extension, all students. We have policy leaders and education experts joining us today for this important conversation that I'll bring on in just a minute. 
We're so thankful to have more than 1,000 of you who registered to join us today. And we're also streaming this live on Facebook for anyone who may not be able to enter the webinar because of capacity limits. So you can let your peers know if by any chance they're not able to log in, they can watch us by simply going to the CHCI Facebook page. It seems we've had a tremendous amount of interest in this event. Finally, a couple of housekeeping items. This session is being recorded, as you hopefully noticed when you logged in, uh, and it will be available on the CHCI website afterward. Also, once the session is concluded and or you sign off, you will be prompted to fill out an evaluation survey. Please let us know how this session went for you and how we can make these events better and more informative going forward. We received a great many thought-provoking questions in advance. Because there were so many, we've tried to organize them into topics and themes and use those as the basis for my initial questions to the panel. So apologies if we don't ask your question exactly as you wrote it, but hopefully we'll cover the topic you're interested in. The Q&A feature here on Zoom is enabled. It's the button on the bottom right. It should be on your screen, I think. And you will be able to submit questions during this hour. And towards the latter half of our time, I will pull from those to have our panel answer them. Note, please don't submit questions via the chat function. That's for commenting in general. And we won't be uh, monitoring that to pull questions from the chat to put into the queue for the Q&A. And finally, of course, as a friend of mine likes to say, it is a live show. So we hope we won't have any technical issues navigating this virtual format, but please bear with us if we do, we'll work to resolve them as quickly as possible. Now, as you know, at CHCI, we focus on developing new leadership for the Latino community, convening established leaders from all sectors, and engaging in dialogue about the most important issues facing both our community and the nation. This work is critically important right now because as we have now seen, the current crisis has exposed and further magnified the deeply rooted inequalities in our society. Education has been fraught with inequalities too, but we know that it is also a critical tool in the work to dismantle racism and empower people in our society. Now more than ever, our voices matter and need to be heard. We must have a seat at the table, not only as we reflect on the present crisis, but also to ensure we prevent further inequality in the future. The core of any future solution must include both diversity of thought and of the decision makers that reflect our diverse society. So let's get to the discussion and meet our panel. I'm only going to provide the briefest of introductions for our speakers each time I welcome them, both in the interest of using our time most efficiently and because in this new, highly digital world, I encourage you to look up these incredible leaders online, to learn more about them, and you can even engage with them via their websites. I will introduce all four, bring them on screen, as you, as, if you will, uh, and then I'll invite them each to give some opening remarks once we've all gathered together. So first, to start, of off, start us off, I'm pleased to welcome Congressman Raul Grijalva, who proudly represents Arizona's third congressional district. A former community organizer, school district governing board member and chairman, and county official, Congressman Grijalva also serves on CHCI's advisory council. Welcome, Congressman Grijalva. It's great to see you. Good to see you, Marco, again. Thank you. Wonderful. I think, I don't think we have you on video yet, but I'm sure my team will take care of that. In just yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> and while they work on that, let me continue introducing uh, uh, our uh, remaining panelists. Ah, oh, there we are. Our next guest is Lily Escolson Garcia. She's president of the National Education Association. Lily's career in education began as a school lunch lady and now leads a professional association of three million educators. I believe it's the nation's largest labor union. She's the first Latina, in fact, to lead the NEA. And we are grateful that Lily also serves as secretary of the CHCI Board of Directors and is a dear friend. Welcome, Lily. And now I'm pleased to welcome Randy Weingarten president of the 1.7 million member American Federation of Teachers, AFL-CIO, also known as AFT. Randy has led the AFT since 2008 and during her tenure has launched several major efforts to place real education reform and innovation high on both the nation's and the education field's agendas. And I want to mention that we are very fortunate that AFT's Executive Vice President, Evelyn De Jesus, also currently serves on the CHCI Board of Directors. So thank you so much for joining us, Randy. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Patricia Gandara, research professor and co-director of the Civil Rights Project at UCLA. A towering figure in the field of education, having published numerous times on her research, 
on her research and prescriptions for education, including several books. Patricia was appointed to President Obama's Commission on Educational Excellence for Hispanics, where I had the pleasure of working closely with her, as well as Lily, who also served on the commission. Welcome, Patricia. And now let's get, to, uh, let's get to the opening remarks and we can start with you, Congressman Grijalva. Thank you, Marco, and please thank uh, your staff at CHCI and the board uh, for hosting what I, I, I believe is a very urgent discussion that we're having. And I'm, and I'm uh, honored to be here with my co-panelists, uh, people who I admire and uh, people who have uh, led, led the fight and been instrumental in the, in the effort to uh, work for better schools and to save, quite frankly, our public school system. I'm very honored to be with them. I, I, I want to begin, and you, you, you initiated that with your opening comments, but with, with, with some very brief remarks. And uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to quote a, a column that I read in the newspaper. And you know, some of us still believe that knowing the news is an important thing to know during these times and be aware and have information. I, uh, the quote I, 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 that stuck with me is, it was that, uh, you know, that fighting uh, the coronavirus is, isn't only a matter of public health, that it's a matter of civil rights. And, uh, and I agree with that. And I think with, with, with the efforts that are ongoing sooner than later, uh, we're gonna find a vaccine to blunt the COVID-19. And today I think uh, the discussion is about that same commitment to ending the racial divide of, uh, and, uh, and, and looking at our public school systems as a source of support, as a source of talent, as a source of, of advancement and, uh, and doing right by our public school systems. Uh, because the story of COVID-19 is about historic racism uh, that's in our nation. And, and we all have to look at the disproportionality, disproportionate rate of mortality in communities of color. The, the one uh, articles I was reading that one of 12 Latino families have had the symptoms, but the lack of testing uh, <laughs> has, has prevented from really getting a gauge on what that is, that is, but it's it's obvious that based on mortality rate and positive test of infection, communities of color and in the Latino community in particular, uh, it speaks to what in those communities has been neglect, uh, economic isolation to a great degree, lack of health care, uh, immigration status of people, poverty, bad air, bad water, and uh, in our schools. Uh, during this uh, this pandemic and the need to control the spread of the disease and the closure of schools, what did we see? Uh, something that teachers and, and, and education advocates have been telling this country for years. The digital divide, obvious and there. Uh, the nutrition and security of children and families in those communities. The potential achievement loss because of the lack of contact. The, the, the dropout of elementary school children that, that teachers lo lost contact with, the quality of our facilities, and unfortunately, a Department of Education that condones this kind of failure as a rationale for uh, their efforts to privatize our public school systems. I hopeful sign through all this, uh, that thread of hope that ran through all this response in the public school system was the teachers and the support staff. Uh, that suddenly, uh, I hope, the, all of America came to the realization that these essential employees do more than uh, merely uh, uh, control a classroom, that they're integral parts of that community. And, uh, and the responses that I've heard from parents and community people about what teachers went above board, support staff, bus drivers, the cooks, the 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 support staff at all levels and how they um, continue to care for and, 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 uh, and attempt to educate the children that they're responsible for. That was good. And so as we kind of convulse at, with outrage and frustration at the murder of uh, George Floyd, let us, uh, I think we need to understand that this systemic ugly legacy demands a systemic response. And our public schools are going to be key to that response. How we, uh, how we strengthen them, how we finally deal with inequities, how we provide resources are all gonna be part of the recovery definition for this country as we go forward. 
And so I'm, I'm very grateful to you for this opportunity and uh, look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Powerful words. We appreciate that. Um, and now, uh, Lily, let's hear from you. Uh, gracias y que honor estar aquí con ustedes uh, por todo el mundo. Um, no one would have guessed two weeks ago that the COVID pandemic would be bumped off the front pages of the newspaper. But I, I have to tell you, who's really surprised that yet another tragedy like this, another death of an unarmed black man at the hands of those who see black lives and black deaths as if they simply don't matter. And too often, we all know this, black and brown adults are treated differently than white adults. Black and brown children are treated differently than white children. We see that justice and, and opportunity and access, it's not equal. It's, it's parsed out based on your race and ethnicity and all the protests that we're seeing, all the anger and, and, and uh, pent up um, despair that we're seeing is not about the death of one man. It's about the systemic, institutionalized, accepted generational culture built around the belief that white is better, that white is supreme, that if you are not white, you are less than. You have less opportunity, less access, less justice. And without actually saying it, it's embedded in our culture now. But that's just natural. This pandemic is a natural viral phenomenon, but the impact that it's had on communities of color exposes the man-made inequality, the injustice that's born day after day by black and brown people. So let's talk about the impact on immigrant communities, Latino communities in particular, immigrant communities who so often live in fear of a family member who may face deportation so they don't go to the hospital when they're sick. Many who, if they wanted to go to the hospital, don't have access to health insurance. The poverty rate in Latino communities is high. Um, and I know this, I am actually sitting in Juarez, Mexico right now speaking to you because that's where my husband has a home. And what we know is that when you live in poverty, you live with your adult children, tios and tias and abuelos, you live with a whole bunch of people in your house. And many Latinos work in the service sector. If there's a language barrier, you're often limited to the jobs where you are cleaning hotels or you are in restaurant kitchens. You're in high risk industries like meat packing plants. You're just trying to put food on the table. And if you get sick, you bring it home to a very large family. And let's specifically talk about this forum because this pandemic is impacting Latino children, students in our public schools, because the inequities in how schools are funded, uh, there are poor communities that have less for their schools than rich communities. It shouldn't be that way. It's not natural to be that way. It's intentional. And that means our Latino communities, which face such disadvantages, are more likely not to have a school nurse, a decent class size, counselors, advanced placement programs. Families are less likely to have broadband Wi-Fi access in their home or a laptop for their kids to use in this pandemic where um, teachers need technology to keep in contact with their kids. So our Latino kids are falling farther and farther behind in their schoolwork because of this pandemic and what they don't have in their lives, not just in their school lives, but in their home lives. They may not have access to nutrition programs to lunch during this pandemic. And it's going to be worse in the fall because the meager tax revenue that funded our schools have fallen off a cliff. Sales tax, property tax, income tax, any combination has taken a huge hit in this pandemic. People are losing their jobs. They're not going on vacation. They're not going to the mall. We're not collecting the tax revenue. School districts in this very moment right now are looking to slash their school budgets 20, 25, 30%. And most of a district school budget 
pays for teachers, the custodian, the coach, the bus driver. There is a plan for help. There is a national plan for help. It was passed. Thank you, uh, Representative Grijalva. It was passed by the House of Representatives and it is being stalled by Mitch McConnell and the Senate leadership right now. It's the HEROES Act and we need them to send us some heroes right now to keep from laying off those education workers, those teachers and support staff. This money would be sent to local and state governments and school districts. Mitch McConnell said it's dead on arrival. They were holding hands and singing Kumbaya across the aisle when it was for a business. And now we need everyone on this call to be calling their senators and saying pass the HEROES Act so our communities and our students are protected. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. And you've touched on a lot of the things I think we want to get into uh, uh, when we get into the dialogue. So thank you for that. So Randy, I know you have some, some perspective and some thoughts to share as well. Um, great. Can you, so I am today decided I would wear instead of a, you know, a nice sweater, I decided I would wear this t-shirt that says repair the world. Mm. Um, and, and, um, you can and and because I think that that is a moment in you know in in uh, my I am married to a rabbi. We are both doing our Zoom calls right now. Sorry, you may actually hear her, but you know tikkun olam, repairing the world, justice, zedek zedek. I think that we are in and and I will be very repetitive of um, Representative Grahava and my dear friend Lily Eskelson Garcia. Um, because I think that is the moment that we are in. My apologies for it. We are in three crises right now, made worse by a president who, and I'll just borrow um, George Bush's words, who lectures, doesn't listen. A president who has actually no idea how to um, focus on the people of America as opposed to focusing on himself and the people he believes he serves the rich and the wealthy of the country. What are the three crises? And the through line you can see is the inequality. We have a health pandemic. We have economic insecurity, the likes of which we have not had since the Great Depression. Sorry, I am a social studies teacher. And we have had a long-term justice crisis made real and raw again by the simple, as, 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 as Lily said, you see it. You cannot hide from a police officer who um, put his knee at the neck of an African-American man for eight minutes who cried, I cannot breathe. And instead of those officers helping that gentleman, they watched and assisted in his murder. I think we need to be really clear and explicit about what happened because it needs to wake up people of my skin color who can't hide in the inconvenience of the fact that those of us who are white have had more privilege than those who do not. And so the ultimate issue here is, we come to this conversation about how do we deal with all three of these crises that disproportionately impact people who are poor and disproportionately impact people who are co uh, people of color. The disproportionate number of essential workers who every single day are um, facing healthcare risks for helping others are black and brown. The disproportionate number of people who are sick are black and brown. The disproportionate number of people who are employed are black and brown. And this justice crisis, which is not simply about George Floyd, but about look at what has happened in the last few weeks. So yes, we need to protest and we need to lift up protest and not, and yes, of course, nobody wants looting and no one wants um, violence, 
But protest is what we do in America to actually make change. Protest and politics, activism and elections. But we need to have an agenda that is clear and explicit about what needs to happen. And Lily is right, and thank you, Representative Kahava, because the HEROES Act is part of that in terms of actually taking a tourniquet to the bleeding right now to actually ensure that we can have the states, localities, schools, universities, hospitals continue to do the work that they are doing that the president has abdicated. But it is more than that. It is how do we create a world that is fairer, that is more just, that is more equal. And the three ways that regular people have power is through voting and politics, through public education, and through a labor movement. A world that ensures that people feel safe walking in the streets and have a welcoming and safe environment in schools, where people have access to jobs with a living wage, where teachers have the freedom to teach and kids have the freedom to learn, where healthcare is a right, not a privilege, and where we have immigration that is like what the Statue of Liberty said, not what happens right now. It's a huge agenda, but ultimately, if we come together on these things, we can succeed. I know we're gonna do a lot of questions on COVID and on reopening, so I'm not gonna use my time now. But let me simply say, we ended up putting together a plan for reopening to actually move through the fear to ensure that we can reopen safely because I believe we have to do whatever we can to actually get our kids back in front of us and get our kids engaged in schools and in school buildings and rebuild that community. We have to do it safely. We need the money from the HEROES Act to do that. But ultimately, that is part of the solution of moving forward to attack and address these three crises. Not simply getting rid of this current psychopath in the White House, but to ultimately do the things we need to do to deal with health care and health, to deal with economic insecurity, and to deal with racism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Randy. And as you all can see, audience, there are uh, there's a lot on the minds of our panelists because there's there's just so much that we're dealing with, we're confronting as a society. Patricia, share with us what's on your mind. Okay, uh, Marco, I've been thinking a lot about, <clears throat> as I'm sure everyone has, but I've I've been thinking a lot about what do we do in a situation in which we have a collapsing economy. We have uh, threats of uh, massive cuts to education. And we have kids who, you know, this shutdown of the schools has not only laid bare the uh, differences, the inequalities that existed before, it's exacerbated them. Because while middle class folks ha have oftentimes been able to work from home and provide all kinds of enriching activities for their kids, a lot of people in our community have not had that. They've been essential workers out there, keeping up with the needs of this country while their children have been getting virtually nothing. Um, and so those gaps have grown wider and wider. And, and I think about what, what can we do in this circumstance? And I'll tell you, one of the things that makes me feel hopeful is that I think we have a generation of young people, of youth, that's ready to organize and ready to create a better world. I think they're just waiting for the call. You know, and when I reflect on this, I think about how at UCLA, where I teach, I rarely meet a Latino student who hasn't done tutoring, mentoring, hasn't been working with boys and girls clubs, hasn't been uh, helping out younger kids while they were in high school. And even as undergrads, they tend to go back to their schools to bring along more students. I'm also inspired by what we saw happen in Florida with the students at, uh, at Marjorie Stone, Stoneman Douglas, who actually ignited a whole national movement uh, based on their experiences. 
I look around and uh, noticing how in cities across the country, and most recently here in Oakland, California, it was high school students who organized the city's peaceful response to the George Floyd killing. I think this is really impressive. I think we have a generation ready to go to work. I think as educators, we need to provide them the opportunities and the guidance for these young people who really want to help us fill these gaps. And ways that they can do this, I think, are things that these kids do now, but we, but could do more. And working after school with uh, homework clubs, with reading groups, with sports activities, with arts, with older students uh, helping younger students. And I think if we do this right, and we pay attention to what these young people want to contribute, we may even find that they turn out to become teachers themselves. And we can enroll them and grow your own teacher prep programs in our, starting in our high schools. So that's kind of what I've been thinking about in terms of where do we go for additional resources? Obviously, we're going to fight. Uh, we want to support the HEROES Act. We're going to fight for funding. But we're going to come to some points where we're just, we're just really low on resources and where can we look for other resources. But briefly, I want to remind everyone uh, that there's really more than three crises that we're dealing with. And uh, right now we're focused on the COVID, we're focused on the protests, we're focused on life turned upside down. But you know, too many of our kids in our community were living this before COVID and before the protests. They're the five million students plus their classmates who have been living with the fear of a parent being deported and not being able to keep track of what is going on in class, falling behind, sometimes giving up entirely on school because the world is not a safe place for them. The immigration challenges have kind of taken a back seat with uh, with everything that is going on now, but it's not a back seat for these young people. And sometime in the next couple of weeks, we're going to get a Supreme Court decision on the DACA that will directly affect nearly 700,000 people and their children and families. It will also affect, interestingly, nearly 15,000 teachers and teacher assistants, people who connect deeply with our students we, we stand to lose these teachers uh, and these educators in the classrooms. Studies that we've done at the Civil Rights Project that I co-direct show that immigration enforcement is putting a huge strain on the schools, especially our most challenged schools, our Title I schools. And it's affecting both students and teachers. So just as we must address the racism in our society, we must also address the inhumane system of immigration laws that too are racist. Didn't Trump tell us he'd be just fine with Norwegian immigrants? This is about racism. Again, <laughs> I ponder these things and I can be hopeful that after this pandemic in which the world has seen that Latinos are disproportionately working as essential workers, that people will realize the critical role that they have played in our survival and rise up against the terror that has been wreaked on these immigrant families and our students, who, by the way, are overwhelmingly US citizens. I think we're at a critical juncture in this society, and I like to think, as my mother always said to me, no hay mal que por bien no venga. In other words, nothing bad happens that doesn't bring some good. I'm hopeful that we can be both creative and courageous enough to make real headway on inequality and bring some good out of this. Yes. Thank you, Patricia, and, and thank you all of our panelists. I mean, you all have touched on uh, already, we, we certainly chose the right folks to, to gather around our virtual table here to have this conversation because you all have touched on many of the topics we heard in advance of starting this uh, this afternoon. 
um, from folks who, from uh, when they registered and questions they submitted and even some of the questions I'm seeing uh, come in uh, across the Q&A chat already. So um, uh, thank you for, for your words, all of you, and, and, and for the depth and the thought with which you're giving uh, this topic and the work that you're doing in the education space. So let me ask a couple of quick questions. Let me try to, to, to get in a few here quickly if we can and maybe try to try to hone in on a couple of themes and topics that we're hearing again from folks uh, that folks have expressed interest in. Uh, and let me start with you going back uh, again to the top with uh, Congressman Grijalva. Um, I was going to ask you already anyway about sort of what you saw being done, what was in the works uh, in Congress and or what folks should be looking to asking for supporting. Um, I've heard several references. You've heard the, our panelists mention already the HEROES Act. Um, wonder if you might share just a, a, a quick summary generally uh, about sort of the education provisions in that act. Uh, and if you think there's anything else, right? Is there anything that's not in the HEROES Act that's other things that, that you think from a policy perspective might be something that can and should be done at the federal level? Yeah, and, and, and I think, uh, I think uh, like the panelists, I think it's very important that the Senate act on, on the HEROES Act. Uh, we went from the, from the CARES Act to the HEROES Act to try to make some uh, prescriptive uh, reforms to what was in the CARES Act so that the Department of Education would know exactly what to do uh, with the money that was being provided to, uh, to, uh, to them and to, to states. The budget stabilization, I think, is the key thing. Uh, and uh, both Randy and Lily mentioned that, that, that it's the same here in Arizona, the, uh, how are we gonna cut the $1.1 billion deficit? Everybody's looking at education. And we try to put a, an issue. Uh, the issue for me is this, that I think it's still a triage. It's still trying to stabilize and preventing as much hurt on a system that's already um, being starved of resources, and that's the public education system. And so the HEROES Act is good, it's necessary, it's a stabilization tool, and more focus on, on uh, uh, Title I students and families, more focus on trying to deal with uh, achievement loss, more focus on uh, some issues in higher education as well. But overall, I think the, the you know, have the, the two teachers, uh, Union, uh, union leaders that are with us today that you know we're still we're still short on what was their package of requirements you know and and even you know during uh, during the great recession a hundred billion uh, was put into education as a stabilization issue during the those efforts those stimulus efforts and so I think that going forward it is also about defining uh, issues that that have been talked about here today what we need to do, but it's an investment strategy because once we stabilize and try and prevent the cuts that states and local school districts are contemplating as we speak, uh, and that involves personnel, that involves programs, that involves critical programs to the children that we're talking about here today. I think then we have to talk about the kind of investment that's going to be needed in public education beyond that. And it has to be robust and it has to be sustaining. And so I, I think that we have an opportunity as we discuss future packages. I know Chairman Scott and myself and other members of the committee are not happy in terms of the priority that public education is, is receiving in some of the packages, but that's the reality we deal with in, in, a, in, a, in a government that, you know, our side controls the House and uh, the other side controls the Senate. and. Uh, Nobody controls the president. And so I, uh, I think that as we go forward, uh, in, in, in six months to stabilize, make sure the cuts, avoid the cuts, and then move into a robust discussion and investment on the part of the federal government for the long haul, for the recovery definition of our schools. I think our schools are, our schools are gonna be critical in this recovery. And, and rebuilding of our nation and our schools are going to be critical in uh, generationally how we're going to look as a country going forward. I, 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 uh, I don't think we've done enough. I don't think the investment has been as robust as it should be, but the HEROES Act is a, is, is a means to stabilize and prevent some of the cuts that are being talked about at many levels. Great. Thank you for that. Um, appreciate it. So, 
and I think you've given great information and I, I, I would recommend that folks follow up by, by getting informed about uh, the HEROES Act, right? And to learn more about what's in it so that you can uh, speak uh, with knowledge about it when you're, when you're speaking to public officials. Um, so moving to Lily, um, let's look at sort of the, 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 a different angle, shall we say, not the other end of the spectrum, exactly. Um, uh, you and your colleague Randy, of course, obviously represent work with support, uh, our nation's teacher workforce. Um, so you have uh, a direct line into sort of uh, how things are, as they say, on the ground, in the schools, in the communities. What, and we've heard, uh, I'm seeing on the chat in the Q&A, there have been some comments about, for example, concerns about, obviously, uh, technology, some of you already touched on, right, that there's that challenge already as we move to distance learning this spring. Um, there are real concerns about sort of hunger, right? Um, for nutrition, given that so many students rely on food from schools. And of course, um, Patricia mentioned language access and so on. Are those the top things? Are there other things? What are you hearing from teachers in terms of how they're seeing the situation for Latino students and families? What are the things we all need to be more aware about to make sure to try to figure out ways to be as supportive as we can for, for our students and families? Oh, you're muted, Lily. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Oh. There we go. And, I, and I was being eloquent, yes. <laughs> I, I appreciate the question. Um, we actually took a survey of our members uh, when this pandemic was in a few weeks. And we said, in very general terms, how's it going? Do you have what you need? What are your greatest challenges? And then we took their answers and we asked them what school they taught at. And so we were able to tell the poverty level of the school by free and reduced lunch. And you know that in, uh, in Latino communities, like in black communities, the poverty level of those students is so much higher than when you look at majority white communities. And so what we did was we put their answers. It's, a, it's, it's frustrating, it's inconvenient. Um, I'm having to do a lot of work to get my Zoom lessons together. I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. That, nobody was saying, hey, it's great. But, you know, there was a level of, of this is really, um, you know, this is really um, hard to do. It's, you know, but I'm getting by. Mm -hmm. That, if, if it was a predominantly affluent community, that was what, where the people were. As we asked them, um, um, and went across poverty, it went down to, I've lost my students. I can't find them. Uh, There's not a phone number I can call. Mom doesn't speak English. And so she doesn't answer the phone if she doesn't recognize the contact number because she's not sure someone on the other line uh, that she'll be able to talk to them. Uh, it was, I'm, I'm leaving things on their doorstep. I'm in my car delivering packets of material uh, because they have no internet. They have no ability uh, to pick this up digitally. The issue of translation services. We lost our translation services for our parent teacher conferences for our parents. So the district said, we don't need you because school, is clo school isn't closed, the building is closed. The learning was supposed to continue, but it, 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 so it went from annoying to frightening and the higher the level of poverty. And when there were issues of children who could not speak English or their parents could not speak English, immigrant communities, um, it went to, we're terrified. We're scared our kids are not safe. They're not safe in their homes because um, they they don't have uh, they don't have um, uh, a mom or dad who can stay home and 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 be safe with them. Mom, dad have to go out there, or there's no food on the table. They are one paycheck away from starving. And so you see the disparities. Uh, Patricia was saying it's it's unmasked now. It's, it's not something that's hidden. And our, our teachers, all of those support staff, the school counselors, the school nurses, there's a lot of school psychologists that were calling saying, um, I'm dealing with kids with deep mental health issues. Their parents don't have money to go to a counselor, a psychologist, I'm it. 
and I can't even get them on the phone. So it's real and it's frightening. And I'm gonna go all the way back to the HEROES Act. Uh, it, 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 I'm gonna tear my hair out if people don't understand that that is gonna be the difference between a school opening safely and Randy, thank you for that. I'm gonna use your term all over the place. It stops the bleeding right now. We are bleeding. Though they are talking about 25 or 30% cuts. That means there's gonna be 50 kids in that classroom. I had 39 sixth graders one year. What would I do if there were 49 sixth graders? So we're bleeding right now. And if we don't get, there's, there's over 600 people on this call right now. If every single one of you on your social media, if you're not putting out there, call your Senator right now. Tell them to do the good work that the House of Representatives did. Send us heroes. Or what is going to happen? I think they will open those schools and they won't be safe. We want them open. We want them open safely with all hands on deck, with the translators and the school nurses and, and their teachers waiting for them at the door, probably wearing face masks. But the HEROES Act gives direct dollars to that school district so that people won't be laid off. It gives direct dollars for the protective gear that those folks need. It gives direct dollars for nutrition programs and it gives direct dollars for the technology gap, the homework gap, where those kids who don't have an iPad at home because mom and dad don't have it, they don't have a hotspot, they don't have Wi-Fi, they would get direct help. It would go right to the kids who need it the most. And we know that those are kids who live in black and brown communities. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lily. It's helpful to hear and to know, to understand exactly, right, that the, the the extent of the pain being felt. And like you said, that the fact that, that where and how much the bleeding is, is taking place. Um, so Randy, um, I, I suspect you've heard similar things from the teachers uh, in your organization. And obviously feel free to share if, if you've heard other additional things and so on. But also I, I wanted to focus on, you mentioned, because I know this is also something that's come over in the Q&A feed quite a bit. Um, you mentioned that, that you all have a plan uh, for reopening the school safely. And I, I'm seeing that there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of question about sort of, you know, what do we do come September? You know, there, there needs to be a plan for the summer for certain, but also I think people are, are particularly and acutely concerned about uh, what's gonna happen in the fall, given that again, everyone is scrambling. So um, could you share a little bit more about uh, your plan and again, and, and or other ways in which you think um, uh, teachers and our communities can work together to support the students? Sure. So um, someone told me, was texting me and said I was moving too much. So I, um, uh, this is on our website. It's for free. Um, just go to AFT.org. It is, you know, and, and it's 22 pages. Um, but, you know, the, the, the executive summary is kind of in the, in the beginning and that's a couple of pages. And the, so uh, what I want to do though is say this. Just like I want to ditto everything Raul and Lily just said, um, I should call him Congressman Grahava, but we know him <laughs> for a long time. And and because you know your budgets tell you your priorities, and when um, we see that, for example, already there has been more um, unemployment in education today over in April, five, 490,000 people um, reduced from March or February than in the entire 2008 to 10 recession. You can see the impact of that and the impact as Lily just said is worse in communities of color and worse in um, uh, oh, where we see poverty. So I wanna actually just we know the inequity and, and our good doctor um, talked about how all of this kind of precedes um, the, uh, this, you know, these last three crises. Um, but what we try to do in terms of this reopen plan is to actually say, 
we know that all of the inequities were exacerbated during this crisis. What do we actually do to try and help deal with all of the learning gaps, the digital divide, food insecurity, and all of the agita and stress that so many people are feeling. And what we have done is to say, if we can have a hybrid model in um, the fall, where we do two things, where we actually make sure we're listening to the public health folk and keeping the amount of virus as low as it can be in a community. That was why all those public health folk kept saying, look at the numbers and they should be going down, not up in order to open, you know, or to open anything in society. Number two, have this infrastructure of testing, tracing, and isolation. So if you see a peak, you can stop it by testing, tracing everyone who was sick, tracing the contacts, and then isolating for 14 days. So if you do those health things first, then in a school, you can decide, or you can do, because of the public health tools, you can do something that limits or prevents the virus um, virtually as much, or as much as possible. And that requires, and this is where all of the things Lily says cost money, you can see it. It requires the physical distancing, maybe wearing a mask, maybe temperature taking at the beginning of the day, washing hands, and then ultimately cleaning schools really well every day. All of that costs money, but that's the public health tools. Then you have to marry that to the education tools like, what about in Louisiana? 700,000 kids, 200,000 kids didn't have computers. What about the fact that in LA, we couldn't get to 40% of our kids? So we need to make sure we deal with the digital divide. We need to make sure we, frankly, I think we should be opening school kitchens all summer to feed families of our children, not just our children. And we need to do things to address learning loss as well as what we need to do for next year. The reason I say a hybrid is because there will be some teachers and some kids who either can't or shouldn't come in. Plus, at the same time, if we follow the public health advice in the absence of a vaccine, we're gonna to have to stagger, we're gonna to have to reduce class size, we're gonna to have to reduce the size of, of, of school, of, of people in schools. So the key right now is to work with parents and work with teachers to come up with these models. I have a couple in mind, Dan Dominich, the head of the Superintendents Association has a couple in mind, but it doesn't matter what I have in mind, it matters how we can put this together in communities so people can see that it works. Maybe it's half the kids come to school in the morning, half in the afternoon. Maybe it's elementary and middle school kids go during the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and high school kids go Thursday and Friday, or go on Friday and middle and elementary school kids go Monday through Thursday. Maybe it's that teachers see the same 15 kids so that you can limit the spread of a virus, but in the absence of a vaccine, and then we're really gonna know right now because so many kids are on the streets hopefully with masks, so many people are protesting. We're gonna know if it was a super spreader or not. We're gonna learn a lot of things. But all of this is gonna take money to address food insecurity, to address all the cleanup costs, to address the instructional needs that we have not addressed in a long way, as, as, as Representative Grahava said, to address the mental and the social or the social emotional needs. So I think, we should have more and more and more community schools and wrap services around and make sure community schools become the hub of communities. We should do what the PACT Act does, which is really fully fund Title I and really fully fund IDEA. We should do all of those stuff. We should really fully fund community schools. And for us, our Latino Engagement Committee that your board member, um, Evelyn Jesus, is leading is helping um, steer us in terms of many of these things. But the point I wanted to make is, 
I agree with everything that Lily and, and, and Raul said, but we need to be solution makers and we need to actually see what works. But because we did this plan, that's why we know and it's gonna cost more money, not less. And so I'm gonna end with the same kind of plea that Lily just made, which is we need people to pressure the Senate, even our friends, so they'd see the intensity to hear the HEROES Act and get it passed. It is a Band-Aid. It is not the solution long-term. The solution long-term is we need to actually elect a different president and have a different Senate but long to work with the with Re representative Grahava and others. But we need this now so that the states can continue the work that they've been doing as opposed to having absolute devastation. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I I'm, I'm gonna go on to my question for Patricia, but I, I do wanna note for everyone, we've, we've just had so much, such a wealth of information from all of you, such great and profound and, and, and deep comments um, that we've actually used up almost all of our time. Uh, so we, we unfortunately don't have time to get to, 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 um, to, to get into any more of the Q&A that have been coming in. But what we will commit to you all in the audience is we are going to save the Q&A in the chat feed. Um, we're going to actually share because I, I, I think there were some very specific questions that that uh, I believe some of, uh, if not all of our panelists, will have some answers, some resources. There was a lot of requests really for guidance or information um, for resources. And so we're gonna save that and share that with our panelists. So then follow up in the recap, we'll actually provide some links, some guidance, some materials that can help folks get answers to their questions. Um, but so now, Patricia, you're gonna get the last question. Um, uh, and so I wanna turn to you and, and, and use what time we have left um, also in the Q&A feed, I know that there were a lot of questions, again, as we, as we all talked, uh, certainly from the beginning of this hour, it's so much more prevalent, so much more front and center with us now, um, is this question of the structural and institutional racism and all of its consequences and its legacy. And so my question for you is that, you know, one thing we do know in education that has been studied is that cultural competence in a school setting, in a classroom, uh, has a tremendous impact on improving educational achievement uh, and on reaching and working and supporting uh, students. And so I know you have deep insight and, and thoughts on that. So I wanted, wondered if you could share a little about what your thoughts are, what, what kind of guidance and advice you would have for teachers, for students, for families, uh, for communities about how in fact we can enrich uh, the learning experience that actually takes into account those biases and breaks down those biases such that both we eliminate that racism ultimately and also allow learning to truly happen. So I understand I have 15 seconds to... <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll carry over a minute or two, I think, if, if folks <laughs> well, want to. Uh, well, so let, let me just be very brief. Um, the, uh, I, I think I'm the Pollyanna on this panel because I keep thinking in terms of, well, what is it that we... that what advantages do we have out there right now? I've, I've recently uh, been interviewing administrators across the country about what they're doing for their immigrant kids, Latino kids. Um, and there's a couple of things, things that, that really come right to now. mind. One is uh, in terms of cultural competence and where we go for those resources. Uh, I have been impressed by to what extent districts around the country are pressing into um, uh, pressing on their bilingual teachers and their ESL teachers, the people who are working most closely with these children and families uh, to outreach to them and to come up with solutions. We're really putting these folks through the paces and they're really, really showing, showing up. up. Um, so that, that leads, leads me to think we need to put much, much more, more emphasis on hiring bilingual teachers, teachers um, who generally come with more cultural knowledge about the students and who can communicate with the families. The other thing is, you know, I would like to think in terms of uh, federal policy, where a lot of these districts are getting their resources is from NGOs. Mm -hmm. And they tell me over and over again, we could not do it without our community partners, without the NGOs out there. And I think that's going to become even more critical as we reopen the schools and we look for folks to help us do this and to help us connect with families. So I would hope that we would put some emphasis on uh, providing more resources for these NGOs that are really supporting our schools. 
I'll, I'll leave it there because I could go a lot longer and I know I don't have time to. <laughs> Well, no, thank you, Patricia, and, and, and my apologies to both our panelists and the audience. We, we clearly should have scheduled two hours for this. I mean, we knew we weren't going to solve all the challenges in education in an hour, but um, uh, I, I truly am, 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 am amazed by uh, how much um, information and, and how much ground we covered uh, with you. So I'm really grateful for all of our panelists for being here with us today. I'm going I'm to call it there. I know you all have, I think, follow-up meetings uh, to jump to, and I know our audience as well has probably um, been holding off their family members as long as they could to be on the Zoom. If, if your household is anything like mine. So thank you panelists. I thank you all for joining us. And let me just wrap up with a few closing, very quick remarks. Um, I wanna thank uh, uh, everyone who helped organize this. I wanna thank the CHCI team who did tremendous effort um, putting together this event and, and gathering all the logistics. As you all know, this is a, always a team effort uh, to be put together. And so um, I'm really grateful that, that folks were there uh, to help make this happen and, and that we had our full team able to, to, to put their effort into this. Um, please be sure to check the CHCI website, chci.org. We have update, well, we will provide updates, both follow up on this information, but also um, we have a COVID-19 resources page that specifically speaks about some of the impacts uh, 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 of COVID-19 and where places where people can get resources and it highlights some of the work our partners are doing to respond to the crisis. Um, just a reminder that at the end of this uh, webinar, as soon as you log off, uh, a link will pop up on your screen to take you to a survey for asking for feedback. Please fill it out, let us know how we can improve. Uh, and also for those of you interested, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Um, and also remember that we'll actually reconvene in an hour um, to have the second part of this conversation with a whole new panel, this time focusing on post-secondary uh, education. So thanks once again, everyone for joining us. Uh, please, as always, have a good afternoon and stay safe and healthy.